After becoming a necessity during the pandemic, remote work and hybrid work are here to stay. Is that a good thing for employee satisfaction and productivity? And how do you integrate people into the corporate culture who rarely work in the office, especially young workers who may never have in their careers? Steve Lovig, Senior HR Consultant at Flex HR, an HR outsourcing provider, has ideas about how to ensure that hybrid work is a positive experience for everyone. In the podcast, he talks about the ideal mix of in-office and remote work days, shares techniques for helping people feel valued, and explains the importance of onboarding and setting a positive tone. He also gives his take on essential technologies and how to incorporate generative AI responsibly. This is Modern HR. Steve, can you tell the listeners something about your background in HR, both in HR leadership roles and now as a consultant at Flex HR? Be happy to. Thank you, David. I'm Steve Lovick, nicknamed Captain HR by a former colleague. I'm a former adjunct professor, and uh, I dabbled in writing and hosting podcasts. My background primarily includes more than 25 years of know-how in human capital management, employee relations, rewards and recognition, performance. My HR career started with five years at GE Capital. I moved on to start the HR function for Kaplan, their higher education corporation team, Uh, then transitioned to another group of career colleges where I created another HR team from scratch. And and then finally, providing HR executive leadership to a nationwide mortgage company before stepping away from that and the day-to-day corporate HR. That's where I started my partnership with Flex HR Inc. That was July of 2023. And I'm now a senior strategic human resources consultant. I've got my own consultancy, but I I partner primarily these days with Flex HR. There has been some frustration and controversy over how to motivate employees to come back into the office after they got accustomed to working remotely during the pandemic. And some CEOs have receive negative publicity, to say the least, for enforcing mandates, while there is other employees and prospective hires that have made it really clear that they expect to be able to continue working from home at least part-time. What do you think have been the most challenging aspects of this for organizations? I want to go back a little bit, but I, I will say just to, to answer directly that when a CEO says, Y'all have to come back into the office. That's a Southern term, y'all. There should be specific reasons why. And because we're paying for this beautiful office anyhow isn't really a good reason in most employees' minds. So, you know, remote work, or as we used to call it, work from home, if you remember that Mm -hmm. term, has been around for a long time. It was really the COVID outbreak along with available technologies in early 2020 that pushed it into the forefront of everybody's minds, employees, business owners, the public in general. You know, I recall writing a WFH policy, work from home policy in 1996 when I was just a baby HR rep for GE Capital. Maybe you could remember this concept. Employees had to take a laptop from the company home with them the night before they were scheduled to work from home, and then they had to bring that laptop back the next day they were in the office, plug it in, maybe take some data off with a disk or even a diskette. And it was typically just a a one day or maybe a two day a week proposition. Mm -hmm. Today we have uh, a couple of terms to keep in mind. You know, when when an employee works from a home office all the time, generally referred to as fully remote work or remote work. When employees work from their home offices on certain days and then still have to go into a designated physical workspace in the company's offices on other days, you know, we'd call that a hybrid work setup, which is uh, really the direction we're going. And and of course, in office, working full-time inside the company offices each day. Are companies struggling also to come up with credible reasons to come into the office? You know, it, employees will say, well, I've been doing my job effectively for the last three years. 
Why do I need to come in now? And some of the pushback is around training or the culture of the company. And there was a, a recent survey by Forbes that told us 32% of employees want to work fully remote compared to 59% who would prefer hybrid. Just 9% of the people surveyed would want to return to an all office schedule in the future. Mm -hmm. I've read articles that point to three days in the office, often Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as being the best kind of compromise. Some companies are saying, well, you need to be in two days or three days and you can choose it. The problem with that is the company allows employees to choose the days. The employee could wind up with the people they need to talk with on that day. You know, one of the reasons they went into the office to start with, maybe working from home that day. So the flexibility could become a hindrance to productivity. So, you know, as companies start to ask, or like you said, even demand employees returning to the office, explaining the reasons, you know, employees being physically together can offer immediate collaboration, stronger team bonds, you know, just simple things like uh, uh, immediate access to on-site resources like printers and shredders. I would also suggest that in-office environments can help build trust, social sharing. New employees can learn from experienced folks in person. It's not impossible, certainly, but it's more difficult if they're having to set up scheduled times to meet on video calls. So office work typically is well suited for people who live near the office, require regular human interactions, actively collaborate on physical tasks, or, or maybe, David, they, they just lack the on-the-job experience and that face-to-face -face training is helpful to get them up and running. What are the minimal must-have technologies that companies need to have to enable a hybrid work approach that helps to foster this positive employee experience and maintains productivity? Productivity, I would say, you know, it's kind of, kind of the, the basic tools, whether it's a, a Google product or a Microsoft product. From communication tools, we've got Microsoft Teams, Slack, uh, having a SharePoint or Google Docs drive are musts so that documents that I work on here and save the HR manager for my client that sits in uh, about two hours away in another part of Georgia can pull those uh, saved documents up on a SharePoint drive, in our case at Flex HR. I recently participated in a panel discussion where we talked about technologies that offer dozens of ways to stay connected, plus recognize and even reward employees. And, and I think that's where you asked about that positive employee experience. Um, I had a, a long partnership with Gusto, not the payroll company, but a, a specific rewards and recognition company. It's G-U-U-S-T-O, Gusto, um, at my uh, last corporate gig. Uh, Gusto provides a social media-like setup where any employee could recognize any other employee through their contributions, virtual shout outs, simple thank yous that would show that the person's efforts were valued and recognized. And then that I say social media like it would display on your desktop or your phone. Um, plus, I developed a plan for our department managers to recognize employees, whether it was on their team or across the company. Based on achieving various levels of performance, the managers could give a gift card that the employee could redeem. And, and through Gusto, it was over a thousand different vendors that the employees could choose from. But, you know, depending on the size of the company or just the opportunity to budget some money on that type of rewards and recognition technology, I would say that there are plenty of ways to reward and recognize employees with very little expense. How about a simple appreciation email telling the employees how much their work means. And 
this is my uh, personal favorite, even better, a handwritten note of appreciation. I used to send handwritten cards of thanks for various occasions, and, and several times the person receiving my note would send back a thank you to me mm -hmm. because that handwritten yeah. note was so unexpected. Right, yeah, it's getting rare nowadays, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if, if you've ever heard about this. Have you ever heard of sending a thank you letter to the employee's home addressed to the spouse or the children? No, I haven't heard of that. No, huh. I, I just love this. It, it happened to me decades ago, uh, but I, obviously I still remember it. You know, if you, you think about it, employees spend so much time in office, even if it's at a home office, they're away from the important people in their lives. They're away from those interactions for a good chunk of a day. And just think what, what a gift you could give to the employee and, and, uh, and their family when you tell the family about the value the employee brings to the company, why they spend so much time there, and, and just thank the family for allowing the employee to spend so much of their time with the company. Yeah. I just think it's a, it's a cool idea, and obviously it costs pennies. Right. You know. That is a cool idea, um, yeah. I, I think just celebrating important milestones, achievements, special occasions, and, and if it needs to be virtually, so be it. Do it virtually. Do it as a team to foster a continued sense of belonging and unity among remote, hybrid, and all employees. So this remote and hybrid work environment we're in now, it also presents challenges in maintaining like a positive corporate culture and, and a positive employee mindset. I know you have some ideas on how to do that. What is maybe the most important advice that you typically give organizations about how to maintain a positive culture in this kind of environment? Communicate, I think would be the most important, just single line. Um, you can find plenty of ideas online. Some of the things I've worked on is having an HR team or, or even a collection of employees, like a, an employee resource group people have probably heard of. Uh, to solicit feedback, especially from remote employees on their experiences and challenges, and then provide recognition for their contributions to the team dynamics overall. You know, you can schedule virtual coffee breaks or casual check-ins where team members can connect informally, share updates, bond over non-work-related topics. Uh, you know, we, we've, I suspect all of us have heard about uh, happy hour where you get on a Zoom call, all of the team, and it's uh, 5.30 on a Friday afternoon maybe, and you have a beer or white wine spritzer or uh, just some iced tea, whatever you want, and, and the team just connects informally. Mm -hmm. I've always encouraged remote employees to get involved in their local communities through various volunteering opportunities, charity initiatives, community service projects, to foster that sense of purpose and social responsibility where they live. You know, the company may be headquartered in a different state than where the employee works, and the company may have some social uh, beliefs and initiatives and projects that they focus on, but encourage the employee to do something for their community when they're disconnected maybe from the, uh, the corporate setting. And, and if possible, whether it's HR or a specific philanthropic kind of department, just find things that employees can do in their communities. Mm -hmm. I also think, I, I mentioned communication, kind of period, uh, leadership visibility is really important in a hybrid or any kind of a virtual environment. The, the leadership needs to remain accessible to those remote employees. Regular communications, one thing that, that I've suggested to leaders is have virtual office hours where they're going to be available for a video call between three and five every Wednesday, something like that. And one-on-one -on -one check ins to provide support and mentorship. Now, depending on the level of the leader, obviously that could be a challenge. 
Um, you know, other, other folks do virtual lunch and learn sessions, remote employees grab their own lunch, sit in front of their uh, desktop or laptop or even phone and learn, discuss, share professional ideas. Uh, there's virtual team activities like online games, trivia contests. Another thing we, we might think, you know, in the good old days, like 2020, where we all typically all went into an office building, you'd have a wellness event and uh, nurses and practitioners would come in for a day, half a day, and you'd uh, do the know your numbers thing and learn about chiropractic or yoga or whatever. Well, there are also virtual wellness programs and resources available for physical, mental, even emotional well-being for remote employees. So those uh, kind of offerings to remote employees, especially if you've got some remote and some in-office employees, making sure that all employees get resources that they need and the communication and the recognition. What do organizations most often get wrong, would you say, about trying to address the cultural issues that are brought up by hybrid work? Sometimes companies will try and put hybrid or remote work into a box, thinking they're completely different animals from one another. So you got the hybrid box, you got the remote box. Employees working a hybrid schedule can have some of the same issues as someone working a fully remote schedule. So really, I encourage, it goes back to that word communication, ask them about their experiences and listen closely to what they're saying they need from the company. You know, I, I say that because uh, I have an experience where I, I thought employees said they wanted more PTO. That's, that was what they checked off in the online survey. But when we talk to them, when we listen to their reasons and their stories, what they're really looking for was more flexibility with their schedule. So can you adjust that schedule? Could maybe they work uh, four tens? Could they take a, a two hour lunch occasionally or every Wednesday, taking care of doctor's appointments, school meetings, things like that. So flexibility. I think is uh, one of the failures that we don't see. We had a near total reliance on remote work during the depths of the pandemic, especially for white collar jobs, less so in professions like retail and certain services where the workers definitely had to be on site. But the remote work also made it harder to transmit the corporate culture to newer employees, I would say, and help people to feel integrated and like a really equal member of the team, especially true of young people that are just out of high school or college who might be in their first full-time job and never had the experience of going into the office every day like uh, we older workers did. What's your advice about integrating employees into the culture and helping them understand what the culture even is in this age of hybrid work? Integrating employees into the culture really starts with the onboarding process for those new hires. I think it's, a, I know it is a major source of retention, a good onboarding. When, when somebody is being onboarded, truly feels welcome. And I, I wish I could remember the source. I was thinking about this earlier, but I, I read an article saying good impactful onboarding will lead to a more satisfied and productive employee at the end of their first year. So you end of the first year, you do some uh, measurements, that onboarding truly made a difference. And I've done this in the past, insist that all parties be on camera during the onboarding process. If even one is virtual, then all of them should be on camera. So the new hire, the HR rep who's moderating, the IT team, any execs that pop in to say hello, anyone else saying anything to the new hire should be on camera. And then I like to have the department managers follow up, send an email at the end of their first day, just checking in, asking them about their feelings. How do you feel after day one? What questions do you have? And then I like to have the HR team send an email to the new hire on day five, a phone call if possible, but it doesn't have to be a setup Zoom call, anything like that. Just 
ask them what they've been meaning to ask somebody all week or and they didn't know who to ask or to tell us what they know now they wish they had known on day one and then again be sure to use their input to improve all future onboardings that interaction that feeling of connection is vital to keeping employees engaged and productive do you advise particular types of training specifically for people who are new to the workforce it could be maybe even about business etiquette and the other soft skills they need to be effective great question and and like you and listeners i suspect we've all heard stories about companies requiring employee training on, like you said, various soft skills, business etiquette, communication, one-on-one type courses. And, you know, I, I certainly agree for some people, for someone entering their first corporate or professional role, some basic communication skills could be useful. Um, including some basic HR knowledge would also help. For example, understanding how PTO is accrued, uh, what to do if they wake up sick one morning, even what to do if they ever feel threatened in any way, and maybe even who to call with an IT problem. You know, all of those little questions will help the new hire feel like a true part of a team of people who care. Mm -hmm. Most organizations are scrambling right now to figure out how to take advantage of AI, especially generative AI, such as ChatGPT, and employ it both ethically and effectively. How do you think more widespread use of AI in remote or hybrid work environments could impact employee satisfaction and productivity? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not an AI expert. I, I use it daily. I use ChatGPT daily for little things, but I would say from like a 50,000 foot view, the use of AI is widespread and yeah, brilliant, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's really been around for quite some time. If you think back to the chess app that would be installed on every new PC you bought in the uh, early 2000s, even the late 90s, uh, even today. And, and the world chess champion, Gary Kasparov, after defeating the computer in 1996, lost the next year to Deep Blue in a rematch of championship chess. And that's a form of AI, of AI learning. Today, we're mostly hearing about ChatGPT, like I mentioned, maybe Google's Bard, and how they're being integrated into the workforce. I would say, David, from an HR perspective, Leadership needs to decide whether to permit it or try to keep it out of the company's computers entirely. Uh, I read an article about Google. They have advised their employees to be cautious when using AI chatbots, including their own product, Vard, particularly in relation to handling confidential information. The company's longstanding policy is to safeguard information, including not allowing employees to put sensitive or internal materials into AI chatbots since there's a risk it could be leaked. And if you read the cautions before you log into or sign up for a chat GPT, for example, uh, you'll note that what you put in there is saved in that system to possibly be used by somebody else at another time. So you have to think about from a corporate perspective, from a, a compliance and legal and HR perspective, what AI is going to mean to the organization. Um, certainly, I would encourage HR professionals to partner with IT and legal to create a policy. Make no mistake, a, a policy must be implemented and employees need to be trained on its meaning too. But uh, here's another kind of gotcha stat that I read. According to Gartner's 2023 Employee Perspectives on the Future of Work survey asking about AI, 19% of employees who have used generative AI in their work in the last 12 months have done so while working at an organization that has prohibited the use of AI. So, Interesting. <laughs> think about that. Yeah. 
So if policy is fine, there's got to be an educational component included in it. And we need to get those implemented across our organizations quickly and then talk to employees about it. Some companies are, you know, you've got another form, you've got to ask your manager to approve your use of AI. Um, maybe it's for a specific project and that's signed off or a particular article or report or white paper you're writing, whatever. Um, I, you know, that, that's one way to do it, but I think we also have to be kind of realistic. Uh, much in the same way, you might tell employees that they shouldn't date or fraternize with one another. It's going to happen. AI is going to be used. So companies want to put their arms around it and figure out the best ways to make it available and to work for their employees. Here are some ideas where ChatGPT might help you. Struggling to write an email, have a, a marketing need, put these types of bits of information into your ChatGPT site and voila. And then restrictions around using it verbatim, around uh, considering what you get out of ChatGPT or BARD as your own creation. Those kinds of things all have to be addressed. And that's why I say get with compliance and legal as well. Well, Steve, this has been a really interesting chat. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.